talked about the heart, let's start talking about the veins and the arteries, and then we'll finish off by talking about the blood. So the two main processes of how the arteries and the veins form is called vasculogenesis and angiogenesis. Now, vasculogenesis applies to both arteries and veins. These are the major, major pathways for your blood. Arteries are distinguished by veins in the fact that arteries take blood away from the heart and veins bring blood back to the heart. That's the main difference between the two. There are some differences as well as in the arteries, they tend to be a little bit thicker because of the amount of pressure that they're under, but overall, their formation is very similar in terms of vasculogenesis. So what is vasculogenesis? It's essentially formation of brand new blood vessels, your arteries and veins that will connect to your heart and start branching out to the various parts of your body. So de novo means brand new or the new formation of these blood vessels. After vasculogenesis, then you get this remodeling, which starts connecting the two together and starts forming smaller and smaller arterioles and then venules and then finally the capillaries, which are the smallest uh, uh, blood vessels that you have. Angiogenesis is one of those things that goes on throughout your entire life, not just in the early development of your cardiovascular system, but also um, through your whole life. And the reason for this is because capillaries are always getting blocked, you're, you're getting damaged to them, and the cells have the ability to secrete a protein called VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, that will promote angiogenesis. And that way, it's like getting a small little creek blocked. It'll just go around that creek, and it'll you know, be able to supply the blood to the cells as needed. So this is an ongoing process. In fact, this is one of those things that becomes problematic when dealing with cancer because a tumor mass can promote angiogenesis and increase the blood flow to the cancer cells. And doctors will typically treat uh, individuals with angiostatins and endostatins, which will block angiogenesis. It'll block the VEGF and block the formation of capillaries so that the tumor is slowed down in its overall uh, uh, growth because it's not getting as many nutrients. So the arterioles, and venules and capillaries, the remodeling into these smaller and smaller branches ultimately is angiogenesis. The major players here is VEGF. So this is the one that I, I would want you to focus on when, when describing in your question that you're gonna have on uh, how the blood vessels essentially form, not only for vasculogenesis, but for angiogenesis as well later on. And I'm not going to get into too many of the distinct processes going on here. I'm just going to keep it fairly simple. But um, the precursors for the vascular structures, these are called hemangioblasts. So remember, this comes as a synergistic combination of both WINTS and bone morphogenic protein. This is what forms the blood vessels and some of the blood itself. But the hemangioblasts, these are the precursors to all of the blood vessels that will form the arteries and the veins in the cardiovascular system. Here, angiogenesis, once the arteries and the veins are formed, then you get this remodeling where you start making these connections between the uh, uh, blood coming away from the heart and the blood going towards the heart, where you form these you know, massive numbers of tiny little connections. Because if you look at the process, you're taking all the blood pumping from a large artery and then as it gets distributed out, you've got to have lots and lots of branching going on to be able to keep pressure pretty much the same. Uh, otherwise, you'll have such high pressure, you would burst the capillaries. It has to branch out to this point to kind of disperse the pressure uh, and increase the surface area so that the blood can reach all of the cells in your body. So you have main arteries and you have main veins and then you have venules and arterioles that go to the main parts of your body. In fact, I'll jump ahead and just kind of show you like this. These are the main kind of thorough paths of the blood as it goes down your limbs. But as it goes out, then that's when you start getting these tiny connections going on that will redistribute all of the nutrients between your tissues, both uh, in your internal organs and your skin, and your brain, and so on and so forth. Now, they've shown that if you block VEGF, then you don't get formation of the, these blood vessels. Here's uh, two pictures of two mice. This is the yolk sac here, and uh, here is the wild type, which means that 
VEGF is working properly and you are getting uh, blood vessels forming. Over here, it's a VEGF mutant where it's not being secreted and you get no blood vessel formation. So they show that this plays a key role in vascular genesis and angiogenesis. Um, this is also believed to, uh, the problems with VEGF are also to believe to be the uh, um, uh, um, main cause of preeclampsia. Now it's not in the actual VEGF protein, but it's in a receptor that gets secreted. So we say soluble VEGF receptor. In certain parts of a woman, um, they will secrete this receptor outside of the cells, and what that does is it actually binds to all the VEGF and prevents vascular genesis. There are certain regions of the body where you don't want blood vessels to form. Well, the problem with women who have preeclampsia is they tend to overproduce this soluble VEGF receptor, thereby sequestering more and more of this VEGF uh, protein that's necessary for vascular genesis and angiogenesis. Ultimately, this leads to problems in blood pressure and with the kidneys and hypertension and poor renal filtration. That is one of the main causes of death for mothers and babies um, during pregnancy. So it's not the, a problem with the actual protein, but with a secreted receptor that binds the protein and prevents it from doing its job, which in some cases is necessary, like in the uterus, to prevent certain uh, uh, too much formation of, of uh, blood vessels and, and things of that sort uh, when the baby is developing. Now, let's look at how the initial arteries form from the heart. Initially, there's just all of these loops, there's these aortic arches, but eventually it starts remodeling itself. And what's fascinating about this is almost no two people have the exact same remodeling. There's the same fundamental process, but there is some flexibility as far as how they form. You know, no two people have the exact same pattern in their overall cardiovascular system. I mean, you can't, there's no way. It's just a random process of kind of forming these capillaries and these veins as the body is forming. So we don't have an exact replica. It's similar, it's almost, you know, in terms of its overall structure but they've shown that amongst you know, people and animals alike that these processes occur, but there's still some flexibility in you know, how much this degenerates and how thick this is and so on and so forth. And they're looking at a lot of the parameters on that. So this is just, all this is illustrating is this is what it looks like initially. These aortic arches start disintegrating and starts reforming themselves. Eventually you'll get the main aorta and then you'll start getting these other arteries coming off of that, and this is what it looks like in the end. You've got the main artery that comes off, and then you've got these um, subclavian artery that will distribute it uh, beneath your clavicle, and you've got the left subclavian artery, and you've got the carotid artery, and so on and so forth that goes up to your head, um, and so on and so forth. So here's the, this is the ultimate formation. Here's how it starts, and eventually this is how it remodels itself. Here we've got the pulmonary artery, which will branch off into the left and the right, uh, for the left and the right lungs. Um, and then the descending aorta, this is what's going to go to the lower extremities of the body. So this is what it looks like at first for everybody. And then it starts remodeling itself to form the two main branches. So what are the main, what's one of the main genes that's responsible for these connections? Well, lo and behold, Efrin ligand and efferin receptors. What they find is on the cells that are arterial in nature, you have the ligand. And in the cells that are uh, veins or ven venules in nature, have the receptors. And what happens is when they come together, they'll start forming these junctions with one another, but the arteries won't form junctions with each other. And so that ultimately helps this remodeling process so that when you get arteries and veins coming together, you form these capillaries between them that will then increase the overall surface area and the distribution of the blood between these, but you won't be getting that between actual uh, arteries and between veins themselves. So that's where you get these junctions is the efferin ligands and the efferin receptors that connect together and then form uh, the capillaries. Now here's an illustration of what happens in the chick you saw that in the video, and I'll show it to you again, but here are the vitellin veins that are coming out, 
and you can see how these will continue to branch off and eventually these kind of merge with one another, and these are really the capillaries here, that will get nutrients from the yolk and then bring them back uh, to the embryo itself. You can see how highly branched this is to increase the surface area. Uh, and even later stage embryos, you just see this huge mass of, of blood vessels that are surrounding the embryo. This is what it kind of looks like at this point. You see two large branches coming out. These are the vitellin arteries here. Here's the vitellin vein where it'll come back in um, to the heart region. In humans, we don't have a, an actual yolk. We're not an egg. So what do we use? We use the placenta. We do have a yolk sac, but it's not the same thing. Here we have the placenta. Same process, though. The blood will go to the placenta. It'll get oxygenated. It will uh, pick up the nutrients that is necessary, and then it will bring it back to the heart because we don't have any lungs at this point. And this is one of the reasons why you don't really have any pulmonary arteries initially as well, that it comes back to both of the atriums and then it gets pumped out through the one ventricle. So here's illustrating the early circulation. Remember, here's the foramen ovale or uh, bus ovale. So as you can see, it will, it will as the lungs are, are developing, pump blood, but it bypasses that as well and just goes right into the uh, um, left atrium and the left ventricle and gets pumps to the system. Eventually, again, the foramen ovale closes, or it, sh it needs to close for everything to function properly. Once the baby takes its first breath and this closes, then blood gets redirected to the pulmonary system to get oxygenated in the lungs. Then it, it's redirected back through the left atrium to the left ventricle and then out to the rest of the body. So that's one of the main differences or changes that occurs uh, during the birthing process is that has to, as we talked about, close. So that's how the arteries and the veins essentially form. You get the initial branching of the uh, pulmonary and the uh, arteries and the aorta. Um, and then you get uh, vasculogenesis and, and then you get angiogenesis or the reformation of these. And this is occurring all the time. Remember, angiogenesis is just a constant developmental process that's occurring in you right now. So let's finish off with talking about how the blood forms, how the actual blood itself that goes through your blood vessels forms. Um, we already know about stem cells and, and differentiation. So one of the things that had eluded scientists for quite a while is they did not quite know where the origin of the uh, hematopoietic stem cells came from. They found them in different places, but they didn't know their ultimate origin. They come from the mesonephrogenic mesenchyme, okay? and they'll come into the heart, and then they'll eventually end up in the bone marrow. Now, this is where this comes into play. One of the hardest things for them to do is they were trying to culture uh, hematopoietic stem cells, and they found that when they pulled it out of the bone, they weren't stem cells anymore. They stopped behaving like stem cells. And that's because it's the environment that would maintain these cells in their stem cell fate. And this is one of the, the processes that they found out was that there was an osteoblast in the bone, uh, and that's what osteo is, is in the bone, an osteoblast that in the bone marrow would literally have these junctions, end cadherins, notch, uh, angiopoietin, and that would maintain the cell in a stem cell state. But when you removed it from that, then it stopped receiving the signals necessary to remain a stem cell. So when this cell undergoes mitosis, one remains a stem cell, and the other one will go down its particular fate, whether it's going to become a lymphocyte or a monocyte or a macrophage or a red blood cell, or whatever the case may be, depending upon what hormones are available. So it needs to be, and that's why when you do bone marrow transplants, you've got to take them from one person's bone marrow and put them into the other person's bone marrow um, so that those stem cells can still remain hematopoietic stem cells. They can keep their pluripotency. So here shows kind of that process. Here's the stem cell, the hematopoietic stem cell. Depending upon what signals what hormonal signals your body secretes will determine what the stem cell will start developing. For example, one of the main hormones in your body that is responsible for regeneration of your red blood cells is called urethropoietin. We sometimes just nickname it EPO. Uh, but urethropoietin 
is the hormone that will cause urethrocytes, which are the red blood cells, to form from your bone marrow. And you, you make a trillion red blood cells a day, essentially. You recycle your cells all the time. Your red blood cells can only last about four months before they break down and you just recycle all the material. So your body's constantly regenerating your red blood cells. Um, platelets for coagulation, uh, white blood cells, lymphocytes, uh, and uh, monocytes, and uh, leukocytes, and natural killer cells, I mean, the whole gambit. Your immune system, as well as your blood clotting system, and the red blood cells, which form the main component of your formed elements, all of these come from this stem cell progenitor that's in your bone marrow. So depending upon the hormonal signals, we'll determine that. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is hemoglobin. When you make red blood cells, one of the biggest problems in development is a fetus needs a lot of oxygen, but due to the process of blood going through the mother, then to the placenta, and then to the baby, normally they wouldn't be able to pick up that much oxygen. However, when we're fetuses, our hemoglobin is much different than when we're an adult. The hemoglobin we use is, has what we call alpha and gamma chains. Now, what's different about the gamma? Well, the gamma have a higher affinity for oxygen. As such, they can pick up more oxygen from the placenta. Now, that might pose a problem in normal people because if you can't deposit the oxygen, then, then that's no good. However, fetuses, their muscle cells and the cells that need the oxygen also have a higher affinity than gamma, the gamma um, hemoglobin, um, and therefore, there's no problem. As we get older and as we develop, eventually we displace all of our hemoglobin uh, with, and the gamma chains with what we call beta chains. These have a lower affinity for oxygen, and our cells also end up having a lower affinity, and it works out just fine. But that is a transition. This occurs, the, the replacement of all this hemoglobin occurs, I think, about six months after the baby is born. So it's just a continual process of recycling, and you start producing a different type of hemoglobin. So we actually have alpha, gamma, and beta hemoglobin um, in our genes, and we'll only produce the gamma when we're fetuses, and then we start producing the beta when we're adults or growing up. 